Welcome to Gutter Room. This is Will Sanchez. My very special guest today is Enslem LeBorn. He's a master's runner, and he has several world records that he set this year. I'm delighted to have Enslem as a guest. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much for having me. I just appreciate that you could take the time to have a humble guy like me to come into your studio and do an interview. So I'm, 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 I, I believe I'm blessed that you could invite me to your studio. I hope I don't run away from you. <laughs> <laughs> you got a good sense of humor. Yes, yes. I like it already. But listen, let's introduce yourself to our audience. Tell us where you were born, a little bit about your childhood. Well, I was born in Trinidad and Tobago. As many people know, Trinidad and Tobago is in the Caribbean. I say in the Caribbean. Some people say in the West Indies. I mean, Columbus headed west, and he didn't really know where he was going, you know, so they called it the West Indies. But I say from the Caribbean, you know, uh, a tiny island called Trinidad and Tobago. You know, I grew up in one of the poorest areas of Trinidad and Tobago, and it's called Laventil. So anybody from Trinidad and Tobago, and people outside of Trinidad and Tobago know of Laventil. You know, and I had a saying when I was growing up is that we were so poor, they dropped the OR. We were just poor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but it never, never really stopped me from doing anything and trying to achieve anything. You know, I always felt back then, I had a quote that says, your circumstances may determine who you are, but you are responsible for who you became. Even though I grew up poor, you know, uh, nowadays I don't think I grew up poor because we had three square meals. And just to give you the quick story of how I started running, I mean, one day one of my friends saw me playing soccer. And I was a midfielder at that point in time. I played in the midfield. I was running up and down the field like crazy, just running up and down, back and forth, back and forth, and not getting tired. And he said to me, he said, Anselm, you know, it's, you might be good in running. I said, well, I said, running. I said, no, no, I like, like myself. He said, so why don't you just give it a try? So, you know, I did a few training. I trained for about a month. And then they had this 5K race in Port of Spain, Trinidad, and Tobago. So I showed up at the race, you know, to go run. I warmed up and everything. And then I was going to the starting line, and I took my sneakers off because I was going to run barefooted. Ah, oh, but you train barefooted? Because I always, I'm accustomed to walking barefooted. It wasn't a problem. Uh-huh. Yeah, I already had it. It was like, you know, my foot was like, you know, it's like you get acclimatized. You know, it's like winter. Some people love the winter because the coldness didn't affect them. Well, the hotness didn't affect my feet anyway. So he, he I borrowed his son running. Oh, oh gosh. To run, right? <laughs> And everybody was like, well, and Sam, you know, you got to watch Bowen because he's the best guy. Anyway, so the race went off, and about two miles into the race, I find this guy was going a little too slow. You know, so I passed him, and I went along my railway, and I looked back. He was like about 100 meters in the back, and I won the race. When we were finished, they gave me a trophy. So when the guy gave me the trophy, I whispered to him. I said, when do I bring the trophy back? <laughs> the guy said, what do you mean when do you bring the trophy back? I said, because in soccer, when we win the tro when we win a trophy, we shared it amongst all the teammates. Everybody had it for a week. And then we had to take back the trophy to the league. So I felt like maybe this running trophy, I will keep it for like a month or so and have to give it back. The guy said, No, it belongs to you. And that was the end of my soccer career. <laughs> Once you discover you keep the bling. Exactly. I could keep the bling. I just, I, you know. So how old were you at that time? I was about 16 years of age. Oh, my gosh. That is amazing. So, so, so you were always fast, huh? Yeah, I always had some stamina to, 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 to run middle distance. Okay. I used to run longer distances when I, was, when I was younger. I ran like a half marathon. What was your educational yes. background after I, high school? I came to this country in 1977. As a matter of fact, I came on Independence Day, 1977. July 4th. A story. I attended Boys and Girls High School. All right. Uh, and maybe I never said this before, but I guess I can say it publicly now. My school was zoned. I was zoned for South Shore High School. But I didn't want to go to South Shore because they weren't really good in track and field. Oh, okay. I was looking for a school that was really good in track and field, and I understand that school was Boys and Girls High School. So I had to kind of use an address. I had to get an address so I could attend Boys and Girls High School. And I used an address to 1435 Eastern Parkway in order to attend Boys and Girls High School because uh, the goal... Oh, right. I took the uh, statute of limitations over on that. You're <laughs> safe. <laughs> You had to start your meditation. That was like 30-something years ago. So the, the goal was actually to get a track and field scholarship because my parent 
could not afford to send me to college, even okay. a junior college. Okay. She couldn't even afford one credit. Okay. So I had to put myself in a position where I can get a scholarship to go to college. Okay. So I went to Boys and Girls High School for one year, and I improved from 207 into 800 to 153, you know, and I was able to get a scholarship to go to Seton Hall University. Excellent, yeah, excellent. That's, that's, that's how and I what did you study at Seton Hall? I business accounting. Accounting was my major. Very, very, very practical. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and of course, Seton Hall. Very happy for you to run for them. Oh yes. When I went to Seton Hall, there were seven half milers that came in at the same time, and I was lucky number seven. You know, so seven, and I was lucky number seven. Okay. In addition to that, I went to the Caribbean Games in 1977 in Bahamas. That's the games where all the Caribbean island send their best huge runners in different age category. And I ran the 800 against two other Jamaicans. You know, Henry Meir, you know, was, was one of them, and the next one them was Panther. These two guys came first and second in the 800, and I came third. And they ran like 152, I ran like 156. Okay. And I was so slow, if you go to Bahamas and you go to the track, you might still see me running on the track. That's how slow I was. These two guys beat me really bad. Okay. But anyway, when they came to the United States of America, they never defeated me in an 800. So how did you get faster? Well, I think one to their disadvantage is that they went from a, a climate of 90 degrees to 35 degrees. Okay. And that affected them mentally. Okay. While I was already acclimatized in this country for a year, uh -huh. so 35 degrees didn't have that much of an effect on me. Okay. So it, it wasn't mentally, it was mentally easy for me to train in the cold weather. Uh -huh. And at that time, see, no lot what you call a bubble. And this bubble used to be like 35 degrees in there. And it was kind of tough for them. And they didn't adjust as quickly as I adjusted. And I was able to do very well, as even becoming the top half mile at Seton Hall. I see, but what was your best half mile of time? At Seton Hall, my best time was actually 151.1. <laughs> and I ran that indoors. Indoor, okay. Right. You know, for some reason, I tend to do better indoors than outdoors. I don't know what it is. That's an amazing number. This is 800 meters? 800 That's meters, That's yes. considered half a mile. Yes. Which is well under a four-minute mile pace. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I mean, I never got close to the four-minute mile pace. That's I interesting. I ran about 410. Interesting. So it's a big difference from 800 to 1600. Oh, a big, big difference. In 1999... That's when I turned 40. It was the first year I went to the World Masters Track and Field Championship in Gateshead, England. Uh -huh. And at that championship, I was basically a newbie. No one knew about me, you know. And in Gateshead, all the other guys were the favorite. There was a guy from Italy. He was a favorite. I never forget his name, Giovanni Saverino. He was the favorite. Then there was another guy from Australia. You know, he, they were all the favorites. And I was like the new guy. And, you know, and I just kept. You know, uh, we, we and we had heats. We had quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. Uh -huh. So it's not easy. It's not like you just run one race. We had three different races we had to run. To qualify, yeah, to, to qualify. the finals. Right. Yes. And I always tell people this. They never give out a medal in a semifinal. <laughs> I've never been to any <laughs> meet or any world championship. You just want to come in the top three. <laughs> so then the semifinal came. I think I took like third. Okay. And people will question me, and say, what's the matter? That's when I tell them. They don't give one medals in the semifinal. Okay. And then the final came, and I ran 154.69. It was one of the fastest times in the world at that point in time. You know, and I, and, and I now won. that put you on the map. That put me on the map. All right. And then we had now the 1500, and there was a guy by the name of Bill Krohn from Sweden. He's actually a U.S. citizen, but he's now living in Sweden. And he ran like 334 in the 1500 back in the heyday. I wasn't even close to that. I wasn't even in his time zone. So everybody felt that he would beat me easily because you know, I maybe run 353 in my best, and he ran 334. So that's a big difference. Wow. That's almost a 20-second difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So what happened? But So he had a strategy that he was going to take me out because I can kick. I was a kicker. You had a good kick. Okay. I had a good kick. So he was going to take me out and hopefully he was going to wear you out. Wear okay. me out, you know. Rope a dope. Yes, yes. So I said, okay, you know, fine. So he, he actually took the race out. 
You know, but he had he had ran the five thousand before that. Oh, okay. He was a little tired. So he was a little tired too. I had run the eight hundred. I'd run three rounds at the eight hundred, and he had run the five thousand. So you know, both of us are a little tired. So he took me out, but it wasn't really that fast. It was fast, but it wasn't that fast. And I knew that if if I was still close to him with six hundred to go, you would beat him. I would beat him because of your kick. Because of my kick, exactly. And that's what happened. You know, it was six hundred to go. I was right there with him. You know, with two hundred meters to go, I. I left him and I ran 3:56. That was your time. Yeah, which was which was another fast time. Yeah, cool. It was, it was phenomenal that I could go to the first my first world championship. Actually, a, a young man by the name of Sid Howard was my roommate at that world championship. Whoa, Sid Howard! Yeah, the, the great Sid Howard. Yeah. And he, he sat there. Yeah, I know. I, I, I know. Saw, you I got, you're sitting on an important chair there. Absolutely. Sid yeah. Howard. Yes, I call him the great Sid Howard. Yeah, please, we, we all love him. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Right. He, he owns a few records himself. Yes, yes, yes. But he's a little older than you. I think he's in the 70 group now. Just a little older. <laughs> a little older. So that year you won the 800 and, and the 1500? Yes. Uh, you did it again recently, like uh, well, this year. Yes, I, but I have done it about four times. I have doubled, won double gold medals, I think three or four times. I did it in Gateshead. I did it in Spain. I did it in um, Sacramento, and then I did it again did in France. France. Now, at some point, you became a U.S. citizen or dual citizenship? I became a citizen maybe in the 19, because you had to be here 10 years. So 19, like around 1990, around that time, I became a citizen. A citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as a citizen. Well, that's yes, I'm nice. fortunate to have dual citizenship. Excellent, excellent. You're one of the rare breed that doesn't lose, your, your, your speed is going down, but very slowly. Do you have any theories as to why you're able to maintain speed? Are you, are you eating right? Are you sleeping right? Yeah. Are you, is your love life right? What is it? Yeah, yeah. I all mean, those things? Oh, <laughs> I think there's all those things put together. But I think, for me, one of the main ingredients that I've done is stay away from injury. That's one of the main significant things is that, and they say, yeah, knock on wood. That's, that's just the thing we got in Trinidad. Whenever you say something and, you know, you, you, you want it to keep on going on the way it is, you say knock on wood. Well, it's the same thing in the U.S. <laughs> okay, so, I didn't realize it was a popular Trinidad. Yes, 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 knock on wood. So what it is is that for me, the main, the main thing is to stay away from injury. So what I do is that I stretch before, and I stretch after I run. Really? What kind of stretching? All, I do all different types of stretching. You know, I mean, people talk about static stretching and non-static stretching. It, I, I, it's the same type of stretching I've been doing for the past 25 years. Okay. You know, I, I don't get into all, because it's working for me. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right? So I'm not going to, I may try a little different things here and there, you know, but those stretches have actually worked for me and it really haven't got me injured. And if in practice, I feel there's a little twinge of anything, I take two days off. You know, long ago I used to practice seven days a week. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've cut that back to six days a week. <laughs> that's still a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's still a lot. You know, but another thing that's important is I'm a vegetarian. Ah. Oh. I don't eat any meat. Oh. I don't eat fish, I don't eat seafood. And I how long have you been a vegetarian? Oh, about 15 years. I think that helps you maintain your, I, your speed. I honestly believe that has helped me maintain my speed. Of okay, course, I, now we got the food, you're, you're stretching, yeah. and what was the other thing? Your love life, yeah. are you married? Do you yes, know? yes, you're yes. Married to the same woman? And for 27 years. Well, is that yeah. part of the secret? Yeah, that's part of the secret too. But also, also what's important is that my, my, my diet, in that the past year or so, I have now introduced what's called a smoothie into my, I, I don't eat bread or, or, or anything else for breakfast anymore. I now have a smoothie for breakfast. And that smoothie in, entails, you know, the three superfoods, you know, which is like chia seed, flax seed, turmeric, you know, and, and sunflower seeds, right? And other greens in my breakfast, mm -hmm. you know, so um, two bananas, you know, I bought myself a Vitamix. Uh-huh. You know, and put it all in? Yeah, put it all in. You know, I may add some spinach to it. I may add kale. I may add parsley so to make it green as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and then I may add, you know, uh, as I said, flaxseed. You know, I may add um, um, yeast, 
Okay, yeah. all, all that good stuff Protein that we stuff. all know about, but we don't do. That we don't do, you know what I mean? So I make it kind of green too as well, and that's my breakfast. That's your breakfast. And that keeps me for nearly five, six hours. Okay. Now, uh, how many mileage do you do? It has to change over the time? Yes. It, uh, as I get older, my mileage have reduced. You know, um, when I was younger, I used to go like maybe once a week on a 10-mile run. And that 10 mile run used to be between 62 to 65 seconds, which is close to six minute pace. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when I was much younger. But as I've grown older, that has cut back to like eight miles as a long, as a long run. And as I grow even a little older, it's cut back to like six miles. I'm not a high mileage guy. So how many miles per week do you, are you averaging nowadays? Maybe 40 miles, maybe 40, 45 miles. Okay, so week. you're that low mileage. I'm that low mileage guy. But what was, what's the most important workout for you? Is it the speed work? Is it the long run? The speed endurance work with short rest. That's what it is. Like, you know, at some point in time, you know, I used to do 10 400s with one minute rest in 70 seconds. So that was, you know, 70 seconds sound like a slow time. But as you move from get to number five, six, seven, and eight, you know, it becomes a little more difficult. And sometimes there's the 200 with 50 seconds rest at 29 seconds. Is that what you do? What's yeah. a typical session for you? Right. That's a typical session for me might be, you know, two times five 200 with in 29 to 30 seconds with 50 seconds rest. Okay. All right. And then in between the sets, I may take four to five minutes rest. And that's like a typical session. Or it might be two times four 300 and the 300s are like in 45, 46, okay. with 90 seconds rest. Okay. And now you plan this yourself, or do you work with a coach? Yeah, I kind of, I work with a coach who, because I think, you know, what's important is that I can do it myself, because I'm also a coach, but I think if I continue to train myself, I'll overtrain myself. Yeah, okay, so you don't trust yourself. Yeah, I don't trust myself. You have somebody, a second opinion that, yes, that knows yes, you. Yes, yes, okay. and Rodney Wilshire, you know, a, a gentleman who I've been with for a long, long, long time, you know, he's the one that kind of, you know, we, we talk and he comes up with the different type of workouts that... that, that That's so cool. Now, do you do any kind of cross training? Do you bike, swim, anything like that? No, I don't bike or swim or anything. I, I, I do push-ups, I do sit-ups. You know, I think I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a different type of breed of runner. Okay, you know, push-ups and... Uh, push-ups, sit-ups, I do a lot of, of sit-ups. Sit-ups, really? Sit-ups is considered old school now. Well, I mean. not sit up, but crunches. Crunches, that's considered even old school. Yeah, nobody like, nobody like, recommends like, crunches anymore, but you still do them. Yeah, I do 150. 150, 150. Yeah. Like, like I said, it works for you, don't change it. Yeah, I, and that's the thing, you know, I, I, it, 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 it kind of works for me, and I, I do push-ups. I, I don't lift well, weights. Well, push-ups is considered, it's still considered very good, but crunches are lost its cachet. Yeah. You know, but, well, because, uh, because of all the other stuff that they commercialize. You know, they give you all these other equipment to commercialize. Yeah, the cross-fitting, you know, yeah, they want to you to do... Uh, make life a little easier for you. You know, and it's not using your own body weight okay. in order to do things. And I feel that for me, like, I do push-ups. I'm going to put my feet up on a chair. Okay. You know, for my push-ups. You know, or if I'm doing the, the crunches, I put my foot up on a, a, a okay. chair as well. You know, bend it. I don't come all the way up. I don't go all the way back. Okay. Now, do you take massages? No, not really. Really? You know, but 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 I gotta tell you though, I was when I was in Beijing, the USATF staff and 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 Monsieur was available to us, and I did what was called a flush out. It's the first time a flush out is after you run. You flush out the, the yeah, lactic muscles. That was the lactic. Excellent. Yes. You felt good. Oh my! That was the best. That I'm saying that. You see that one? I got to do that from now on. Next day, there was no soreness, nothing. Well, it also depends on the practitioner who's doing it. Oh, they didn't do it deep. They didn't go deep. They were, it was excellent. You got an excellent excellent, an excellent masseuse. Yes, this year. Okay, well, let's talk about this year because this year you uh, you set, I think, a lot, at least five world records. Six world records. Six world one, records and one U.S. record. Well, six world records and actually seven Americans' records because the six world record is also an American record. <laughs> and there was one American record that wasn't a world record. So it's six world record and seven American records. Now, what was the American record? The American record was the outdoor in the, in the, in the 1500, where I just missed the world record. I ran 412.54, and the world record was 412.35. Oh, we so that, close. That was, that was like the one and only 1500 I ran 
before the World Championships this year. Okay. So I know you went to, to France to represent the U.S. in the 800 and the 1500. Yes. Now, is that by selection, or how do you get to France? Well, the World Championships for Masters is anyone can go to represent their country, right? But the World Championships, the World Masters Championships, is very competitive. You just can A lot of people think, you know, people who have ran well in the past when they were 25, Think they can take off 15 years and then just show up at the world championships and 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 recapture their past no they can't and i'm telling for all the people all out there who want to come back and run masters make sure when you come back you are ready right don't come back if you're not ready because you are going to be fully surprised okay so that's a rude awakening a rude they... awakening. But you would think there should be some qualifiers involved in going to the world championship. You just can pay the fee and show up? You know what it is, is that they look at Masters running a little differently in that they're looking for more people to participate more than anything else. I mean, there is a level where there's, yeah, there is a, an elite level, and then there is a, a lower level. So you don't want to forget those individuals who may not be at the top level. And if you have a qualifying standard, you will eliminate quite a bit of people. Okay. You know, so I think it's a good thing that they allow anyone to enter. Okay. You know, so they can try to recap the or okay. try to stay fit. Yeah. Yeah. As well. yeah. You know, it's not all about winning a gold medal, but it's also about staying fit. And some of those individuals, if they can look forward to going to the World Masters Track and Field Championship, it will constantly keep them fit. So plus, I think to get, it's a good idea. plus to get to meet you and these other great <laughs> runners. I don't know about me. But well, you, uh, I know you're, you're, you're famous for taking all these selfies wherever you go. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's Anselm, you know, you know with the... Uh, I'm, I'm the selfie king, I guess. I, I, so, yeah, I guess you've been looking at my Facebook page. When yes, I was, yes, uh, yes. When I said, amazing, this guy yeah. loves to take pictures. Oh, I tell you, I, I have another friend who I co-host the radio program with, her name is Marjorie. Yeah. She says to me, why are you taking all these selfies? You know, can you not be in the picture? I say, well, you know, if it's a selfie, that means it's I'm in the picture. It's just, I just find it to be fun. <laughs> you made it to China this year, yeah. and I think you got to be selected for those World Track Championships. Right. In China, to go to, to go to the World Track and Feature, for the first time, the IAAF had a Masters event at the World Track and Feature. This year, really? First yeah. time? First time. First time. And they decided to put in an 800 for men's 50 and over and a 400 for women's 50 and over. And you had to actually send in your resume and then they select the best eight individuals, both in the U.S., eight individuals across the world, and then the Chinese get one individual to be in the race because it's been at, as the host. And there were, I think, over 75 individuals who applied for it, and they had to pick the top eight. And fortunately, I was the oldest guy, and I was one of the top eight. The silver and the bronze men, the second and third, both sporting the same hairstyle as yourself. Yes, they were. Must be a fashion now. I'm coming into fashion, Peter. Well, they say if you wait long enough, whatever you've got eventually becomes trendy again. You've never lost it, over. You've no. never lost it. Thanks, thanks, Rob. There they are. Well, there we are. Let me see that. Just at the very end, they're almost a photo finish. I was the old man, absolutely. So the old man, so to speak, took fourth, and I was very, very happy. And that was the best experience of a life. Running in the bird nest was unbelievable. Oh, that's a beautiful place. Oh, it's the first trip to China. It was a fantastic trip. I guess that's one of the advantages of being a runner, especially a champion runner. You get to see the world. Yeah, you You're a little world. poor kid from Trinidad. Absolutely. Here you are, a cosmopolitan. Yeah, and, and, and it was free. It was free. The, yeah. the U.S. paid for it. The U.S. actually paid for it. And another good thing that the U.S. did, and I want to I thank the people from the USATF, they gave us the full package that the open athletes got. So whatever Justin Gatlin got, whatever Tyson K got, whatever Allison Felix got, those type of items, we also got it as well. Myself but you deserve it. I mean, you know, you're, you're the old guys. You're the, everybody wants to be able to reach what you have accomplished. You, you, you represent the pinnacle. Well, I, I appreciate that. You guys are the gods. It's funny that you say that. The commentary of the event by the BBC, I think, was done by Steve Ovet and Cram. And they were very, very generous in their commentary. Oh, and they, excellent. And they paid excellent. me a compliment to say that, you know, Anselm LeBorn did very well 
for being one of the oldest guys in the event. Oh, so my God. from those guys. The commentaries are great. So here you are. You're back. And uh, in the U.S., you did your, your, you got your medals, so you go back to work? <laughs> well, absolutely, yeah. I, I came back from home, and then I had to go back to school. I teach at Seton Hall University. What do you teach? And I teach uh, organizational behavior and uh, business principles of management. Interesting. So, organizational yeah, so behavior. So this is like uh, uh, what, how companies work? Well, yeah, and, and, and management, you know, what, what, what type of things you need to do as a manager, how managers act in a company, and then organizational behavior, talks about people's behavior. And that was a very interesting class because it's talking about behavior. You know, the Myers-Briggs, you know, Myers-Briggs have this kind of personality test where uh, you can tell you a little bit about yourself. Yourself. You know, That's interesting. Don't. I have a lot of experience in management because I used to be a consultant. Oh, okay. And I, from large companies to very large companies, and uh, and I can tell you, the, the one thing that connected all these companies are the people. The people wanted to be respected. Yes. They wanted to be able to contribute, mm -hmm. and they wanted recognition. Yeah. That was the common thread across any company. And that's the, that's important. That's so important. And. You know, when, when you talk about management, you have to talk about what's called a management process. You know, planning, leading, organizing, and controlling. You know, that's like the management process. As, as you said, you know, in that management process, people want to be recognized. People want to feel wanted. And that's some of the things that the companies are doing a little different today. Even I look at Google, you know, the way Google recognizes their employees and they put in a gym, you know, they allow employees to go on walk. You know, they are giving employees quality of life. Yep, yep, it's yep, yep. Quality of life. Quality of life, market. yeah. What are some of your challenges, athletically speaking? What is your next milestone? You know, kind of gear up again for outdoors and try to break the world record in the 800, the 1500, and the mile. And a mile? Yes. What's the mile record for the, your age group? The mile record is 435. Oh. And uh, my, my, my world record indoors is faster than the outdoor world record for the mile. Interesting. All right. The Watermakers, or those, I forget the name yeah, of the, the group. Yeah, the Watermaker Mile. Right. Okay. Yeah. You, oh, you, you, you must be a fan of Bernard Lagarde. He's, oh, he's, he's, just, entered, 40. he's 40. just entered the Masters. Yeah, he's the rookie now. He's flat at the Fifth Avenue Mile just this, last, this past weekend. Right. Well, he probably looks up to you, you know. He says, he actually, probably. Yeah, he actually sent me a tweet at one time. And he I'm says, like, I want to be like you when I grow up. I'm like, whoa, Bernard Lagarde sending this little guy from Trumaca Clavantil in Trinidad and Tobago a tweet. I'm like, whoa, that's, that's pretty good. He knows me. And then professionally, you're a professor, you're going to continue being a professor, and yeah, rise up the ranks? Yeah, you know, I enjoy teaching. It's, it, it, it's a lot of fun. You know, I enjoy trying to motivate the kids as well. You know, it's not just about teaching them management, but also teaching them some life skills too as well. You know, so in, 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 in between my classes, wherever I get a chance, you know, to, 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 to implement some life skills, I do. You know, implement some life skills. Okay. Well. I told them about two books. Yeah. And I told all the, uh, the people out there about two books. One is called The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. That's a classic. And the next book is called The Magic of Thinking Big by Dr. David Schwartz. Those are two books that I recommend okay. to people all of them. And for all the sports fanatic, yeah. there is a book called The Mind Gym. I just learned about that book in France from another individual. You know, and I've already, you know, I, I listened to the audio book. So The Mind Gym for athletes is very important. Excellent. Yeah. Now, finally, I know we're going into overtime, mm -hmm. but you do, you do your own radio show in Maplewood, yes, right? Yes, I do my own radio show. And in, in the basement of your house? In the basement uh, of what, my house. What started that? What? I like radio. You know, I, I, just, I just love to be on the radio. I love to give news. You know, I have to discuss, you know, events that are going on. And, you know, I just decided one day that, you know, I'm going to start up this radio station. Is it a call-in show? Yeah, you're going to have a call-in show. You're going to have everything. It's going to be a live Okay, and it's not, not necessarily about sports? No, not necessarily about sports. It's, oh, that gosh. That's great. Well, listen, you know, thank you. We're over time, so thank you for coming in. It was a I pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.